My sixth grade science teacher told us, if you can make an essay on rocks interesting, you can write anything. While that isn't remotely true, I like his logic, because if a game can make quantum mechanics intuitive, we have no reason to doubt what they're capable of. I found games about superposition, atomic physics, subatomic particles, and relativity, and while they all teach physics, what really ties them together is the problem they face. How do you make the imperceptible blindingly obvious? Velocity Raptor does this by scaling down the speed of light to 3 miles per hour, then introducing each relativistic effect of that change every couple of levels. This shows relativity at a human scale and makes it a force the player can perceive and use to solve problems. Quantum Game with Photons is a laser puzzle game where its laser is modeled as a single photon exhibiting wave and quantum mechanical properties. Most puzzles are centered not around getting that photon to the target, but in achieving a certain probability that the photon reaches the target using the properties of quantum mechanics that each level tries to teach. Quantum Marble Maze is a marble tilt table game that teaches quantum uncertainty by having you push on a single particle and having to deal with the probabilistic results of your actions. Levels are complete when the probability that, if the quantum state collapsed, the particle will be in the goal is above a set percentage. According to the game's designer, the math is all accurate, so he kind of didn't simplify the properties he's teaching. He just removed the system around them, showing the particle in complete isolation. Particulars and bond breakers model subatomic particles by ignoring quantum uncertainty and just showing particles as physical objects, modeling some forces and ignoring others. They also add new features and particles with each group of levels, making the simulation more accurate as the game progresses, just like Velocity Raptor. This is different to photons, which maintained a set level of simplification. The rules of the world never change, puzzle complexity is instead limited by the tools available. On a more basic level, all these games take the infinite complexity of the universe and condense it into a system of rules, which is also pretty much the goal of science. The player's experience is the opposite of this, throwing them into a model of reality and asking them to figure out how it differs from how they think things work until they shift their understanding enough to beat the level. And these games are all structured around beating levels, because these games all teach through level design. Every level in these games either introduces a new concept in isolation where there's little opportunity to fail, tests the player on their understanding of a mechanic, shows the player how the new mechanic interacts with an old one, or combines many mechanics the game has already taught and shows how they interact. Those last two may sound similar, but they're separate to make a distinction between a level that, for example, has you combine a single capacitor and inductor to make a resonance circuit, and one that has you build an entire AM radio out of base components. They're both combining existing mechanics, but one exists to show a specific interaction and the other is using your available mechanics to pose interesting challenges to the player. A more in-depth look at the first two steps is available in this episode of Game Maker's Toolkit. Bond Breakers executes this process really well. The core levels slowly build off each other, leading up to challenge levels. This helps make it all feel like a cohesive game because every level is teaching you the skills to beat future levels. This chart shows which mechanics are used in every level, and you can see from the total on the right how the complexity drops and builds back up again every time a new mechanic is introduced. This increasing complexity as levels amass an arsenal of mechanics to throw at you gives the game a feeling of progression where it's easy for a game that doesn't to end up feeling like a series of unconnected challenges with the sole purpose of teaching you something. Now, I want to emphasize how important this structure is for building up a player's knowledge while making sure they retain all past lessons. It's the core of this video, but there's honestly not much more to say about it. If you want to build an educational game, you don't have to use this structure, and probably shouldn't, it's rather limiting. But you should use it as a checklist. Now, player engagement when using a level-based structure usually hinges on presenting interesting puzzles both to keep the player interested and to make the material seem like it was worth learning. Looking at this, far too many Velocity Raptors levels center around timing sprints. The game is actually a good length for the mechanics it needs to explore, it just could have done with another implementation of those mechanics so each level's challenge could be more unique. Photons presents a solution to this problem with sugar solutions, glass slabs, and vacuum chambers. These are all puzzle elements that affect polarization, but in different ways. It's false-ish complexity, as only one was truly needed to explore polarization, but the game benefits from having more parts to work with and giving the player more options to consider. The possibility of rotating polarization in both directions means I actually have to think through which to use rather than just placing components where they fit. In Velocity Raptor, solutions are usually obvious and the challenge is just executing that solution, meaning the mechanic it tests the player on and the one it wants them to learn are different. In terms of level design, many levels take the lock the player in the room until they find a key approach, an offshoot of the isolation principle. 
Zelda uses this almost exclusively. In this room, you get a slingshot. Then, until you demonstrate that you know how to use it, you can't leave. You can also use Portal or really any well-made puzzle game as inspiration for designing a level like this. It's about minimizing distractions, making sure invalid solutions fail quickly and clearly, and making sure the answer is hidden enough that the player feels like they created a solution instead of finding the one you hid for them. There's a lot more depth to it, but in the end, it really just comes down to designing a level, watching someone play it, and then making corrections. One interesting permutation of this level structure is the soft introduction. This level is the first time you use sugar solutions, but while using them is required to solve the puzzle, understanding them is not. This lets players experiment with new mechanics before requiring them to actually understand it in subsequent levels. It's a demonstration disguised as a puzzle, and it is an introduction before you lock them in a room, not a substitute. One interesting thing educational games can do, which would come off as cheesy in any other context, is to design levels from history. This level is a historically accurate experiment while also being a legitimate puzzle on level with the rest of the game. I like it because it gives a direct, real-world significance to what you're doing and indicates all the mechanics you've learned have some application you just don't know yet. While playing this level does give you a much better understanding of the experiment than just reading about it, I had to read Wikipedia to fully understand what was going on and why it was so clever. They could have given this level a bit more closure by providing that information in-game. I got the same result in the end, but asking players to do outside reading so they can get the full effect of the game's lessons generally only works on the kind of students who would be fine learning this on their own, and those aren't the students who need these games. In contrast, Quantum Marl Maze has nothing of interest other than its core mechanic, but the game is exactly the right length to explore each property of that system. It also doesn't need real level design, because every level is basically this bridge from Ocarina of Time. It's not a real challenge, but if this is your first 3D game, that simple obstacle is all the challenge you need. There was one level of note though. This muffin pan level is shown three times, each testing the same skill but with increasing difficulty. This shows the player they've improved, and also gives them a friendly respite from whatever this level was. It also serves the same role as Bond Breaker's challenge levels. They're unnecessary in terms of the game's learning curve, but their unnecessariness makes the game feel like a game rather than a teaching tool. The furthest limits of this lock-them-in-a-room teaching style can be seen in some of the insane puzzle levels in Super Mario Maker. They rely on your ability to grasp the most subtle properties of some of the game's mechanics and can base entire levels off the interaction of certain entities in very specific situations. I'm impressed by them because these levels make fringe mechanics you could go through every Mario game without noticing critical knowledge to clear a stage. This is actually teaching the player about the complex systems used to program the game, but since it's all converted into physical space where the player can interact with it, what happens when you unstack up a bomb, then scroll it off screen, looks like this, instead of this. Yes, these levels turn bug hunting in a very complex system into a puzzle game. Learning something to this level, requiring knowledge of several fringe behaviors to understand how a mechanic works, is far beyond the complexity of any class I took to get my bachelor's in engineering. But with a good framework, people will figure this stuff out on their own, just for fun. And if you design with this in mind, that audience can be more than just speedrunners and mad people. You need a great base game to give players a reason to try, but after they're invested, you can take the most bizarre word problems from being arbitrary homework to a half hour challenge they know every part of by the end, just because you made them care about finding the answer and gave them a way forward. This technique of transforming mathematical and logical systems into physical ones a player can and wants to interact with without losing the nuances of that system is a subject for another episode, one I will start writing right after I figure out how in the world to do that. Getting back to physics games, I must admit none of them make a formal education their actual goal. But it is mine, so how could they improve in that regard? One of the most annoying things a class can do is add superfluous potential points of failure between understanding the material and succeeding. Velocity Raptor does this when its difficulty comes from a player's ability to deal with the ice physics more than their understanding of the game's subject matter. This is actually the same problem I had in a game I made, which also centered around building up speed. In that game, I couldn't build demanding challenges into the levels because my playtester was at his limit just controlling the character, and using the instant acceleration most games have would clearly break the game's core mechanic, just as it would in Velocity Raptor. So my solution here is multiple acceleration curves, and yes, this gets a little actual game designy. We're going to look at one-dimensional movement to the right for this, but the same curve will be applied on both axes. Here's the current acceleration curve for Velocity Raptor. If you're going to the right at speed x, next frame you will be going at speed y. The yellow curve is used when right is held, speeding you up, blue is when no buttons are pressed, maintaining speed, and red is when you hold left, slowing you down. 
Now, the non-instant acceleration and diminishing returns near light speed are critical to teaching relativity, so those regions stay. What we can fix is how responsive Velocity Raptor is to our input. If we replace the original acceleration curves with the ones I made, the movement starts to look like this. This gives us controls that let you manipulate relativity, but without feeling like that's the only thing that you have control over. Also, in case you're wondering, I'm an engineer, and building this kind of system is still the only application I have for advanced mathematics. I should point out that Quantum Moral Maze also has loose controls, but there, controls aren't in the way, they are the challenge. The controls are also there to drive home the message that the more you change a particle's momentum, the less certain its position. I'll admit, teaching a lesson through the theme of your game's controls is a vague way to teach, but it was probably inherent to the game's accurate simulation, and either way, it's a nice touch. Once we have a game where the player is in full control of their character, we can ask a lot more of them. In this example, the gameplay premise is that relativity only acts along the x-axis, and enemies respawn when they're off-screen. When you miss a jump, you need to respawn enemies to try again. You could just back up, but dashing towards them stretches the visual space between you, pushing their spawn point off-screen and resetting them without the need for extra backtracking. Even if you never miss a jump, time dilation makes enemies speed up as you approach, requiring you to compensate or land next to them. I'm not going to pretend this game is any good, I actually made this because animating this looked tougher than just building the game, but my point is, Velocity Raptor gives you a puzzle the solution to which is always, run at it. And that solution works, because you're in a relativistic world. The other games give you challenges where you have to take their rules into account as part of the world, making the mechanics tools that augment what's possible rather than a key to be thrown at every lock. I realize the timed floor tiles also meet this criteria, but the loose controls led to me just running at them at max speed in my first playthrough anyway, so they ended up being mechanically the same. These Bond Breaker levels demonstrate this difference, where on the left is an intro level where you use the newest mechanic the only way you can, and that works. The right is a challenge level where you have to consider how all the mechanics will interact and act accordingly. An extra note, in my game, sound travels at the speed of light, Doppler shifting enemy sounds. And while not particularly noticeable, it's not difficult to add and is a fun mechanic to mess with once you know it's there. And building systems the player can get lost in that accurately model the part of reality you're trying to teach is the most effective but least reliable way to teach. This is what Minecraft's redstone system does, and it's very effective when players actually interact with it. These games all use gameplay-based tutorials, and while that is the least intrusive kind, they can't teach information that's not part of the game's mechanics. To give the player this other information, many games just use text dumps, and while that's obviously the worst option, you have to directly give the player this information somehow, or there are going to be massive gaps in the education a game can provide. Bond Breakers and Quantum Moral Maze give this information in between level text, and as long as the text is short and relevant to gameplay, this can feel like world building rather than instruction. Bond Breakers also put some of this text in level, making the information voluntary, and at the end of levels, framing it as a reward. Photons and Particulars both make this information available through an in-game encyclopedia. This is similar to games giving you a bestiary, both of which give you little in-game incentive to read, which is where this becomes a problem. Particulars has the unique problem of having to teach a lot of vocabulary, making its encyclopedia much more important than Photons' is, and a better example. Vocabulary is taught well by telling you at the start of every level group what particle you're playing as, and rather intrusively through the encyclopedia. While it is well made, with links between articles, reasonably concise entries, explanations of where reality and the game differ, and occasionally providing external links, reading through the Particlepedia is completely left up to the player, potentially leaving them with none of the knowledge I just listed, and once again, catering to students who would be perfectly fine learning this information on their own rather than ones who will only learn it because it's part of a game. This encyclopedia issue is really two problems, teaching vocabulary and teaching information that doesn't affect gameplay. This encyclopedia issue is really two problems, teaching vocabulary and teaching information that doesn't affect gameplay. The first is relatively easy to implement, just show particle names more often. While playing, I only knew most of the particles by their graphic. The coding of particle properties into graphics is really well done, letting you know most of a particle's properties just by looking at it, which is extremely important. I have to be able to intuitively identify particles at a glance before I can associate a name with each, but the game never takes this second step. I never thought I need to combine an anti-up quirk with a W plus boson to make an anti-strange quirk. That was fun to read. I thought, I need to press circle, then reabsorb the thing. There is a dedicated button for displaying names and a little information, which could have worked, but there's no in-game reason to press it. 
I played with the goal of learning what the game was teaching and still kept forgetting the button even existed outside the levels directly mentioning it. The easiest solution though is just to show the names every time a particle spawns, maybe even show it right before the particle spawns so the player learning the names basically makes them psychic. In a fast paced game this could be a real advantage. The second issue has far more interesting solutions, the first of which is just copy XCOM. If the plot was directly related to the mechanics, they could have made particle properties seem more like important information rather than a continued reading section. XCOM got me to read long articles about made up alien technology because it was part of the story and made me feel like it might contain tactical information. On a less detailed level, in Epic Battle Fantasy there's a bestiary showing the item drops, health, strengths, and weaknesses of each monster, but it's unused for most of the game since item drops can be learned from reading the end battle screen, strengths and weaknesses can be displayed at any time, core mechanics are explained through dialogue or learned through experimentation, and health is always visible. I know that's pretty much saying just make every property part of the gameplay, but if the game is slow paced enough, this is usually an option. I personally would have made the story about personified subatomic particles, so character development and particle property explanations were the same thing, and the rules of quantum mechanics become world building that's passively mentioned along your adventure. This could end up very cheesy, but then again, I played a game that got me emotionally attached to a square, so it could be well done if you get a decent writer. In short, make as much information as possible in an intuitive part of the mechanics, then give all your other info through the story, level design, world building, and if all else fails, and you have to explain things to the player directly, go all in like Factorio. Rip the player into the convenience dimension, tell them exactly how things work, set up multiple examples, let them play with said examples, and then throw them right back into reality. And if that doesn't work, just make sure your info dumps are well organized and have an in-world reason both to exist and for the player to read them. You can't make reading about strange quarks completely optional because doing that is literally always an option, and most people haven't taken it. All of these games could be described as flash or arcade games, with the exception of particulars, which I think is mostly due to the fact that it's the only game with features that weren't mechanically necessary. These include the plot, and the coolest part of the game, building complex particles. When I had arranged the right particles to make a hydrogen atom, an achievement popped up telling me so, and I felt like I had finally built something and achieved more than just making it through the levels. Building structures is not a core part of the game, but I felt like making them all was the only real overarching goal the game had. Building all the molecules in the game would be a great goal. It would give mechanical structure to the game, make every new mechanic more interesting as each opens up new particle dynamics, it would give context to every particle as a piece of a structure, and create an endgame challenge where you have to look back over all the levels, trying to gauge which contain the right combination of particles to make the last few macro particles you need to unlock the true ending. As it is now, the levels are too numerous and too random for this to be a fun endeavor, and particle names are only communicated once through the achievement, making it unlikely for me to learn any of them, and very difficult to get footage for this. Now, the point of these videos is to suggest how to make better educational games, but I realize a lot of you are probably here for recommendations, so here are some actual reviews before I get to the closing paragraphs. Also, I tried to make these videos as dense as possible, so if I lost you at any point, please let me know where and why, or the next analysis video isn't going to be any better. Velocity Raptors lose controls can be annoying, but it's an interesting challenge and you'll gain an intuition for how relativity affects perception. Color shifting is not well explained, but that's the most likely mechanic for people to already understand, and everything else is reasonably well demonstrated. If you're interested in relativity, the game's too short not to be worth your time. A slower speed of light is a game I found. It's basically just a simulation with no level design or any features I wanted to talk about, so it exists. Now you know. Donkey Kong Country with Relativity is an open source demo I made. You can mess around with the mechanics if you want, but it's not a real game. It's also not educational, so it may just end up being a waste of your time. The game was kind of important 20 revisions and a rewrite ago, but in the final version of this video it's just kind of there. So making it was not the best use of my time either. Quantum Marvel Maze feels like an interactive simulation, like a lab to accompany a class. It can't really stand well on its own, but I think it does exactly what it sets out to do. If you want to use it in a class, I would recommend reading the developer's article on the game where he does a pretty good job summarizing the concepts in and surrounding the game mechanics. Though simple, the game passively includes a lot of material which you'll have to read the article to fully understand. Even ignoring the educational side of photons, this is just the best laser puzzle game I've played thanks to the added complexity of wave and quantum mechanics. 
while it does a great job of making you use quantum physics as a tool in each puzzle, it goes full puzzle game and forgets to explain more than just the literal game mechanics, never firmly relating them back to reality or giving further explanation outside the encyclopedia. The game is well made, and my only complaint about gameplay is that it's too realistic in one regard. When a particle hits a surface, that's a measurement, and the quantum state collapses if the particle happens to be there. This means you have to run some wrong solutions several times just to see where the problem is occurring. It could also serve well as a class lab or means of introducing a subject because it too doesn't teach well on its own. In contrast, Bond Breakers, Particulars, and Velocity Raptor can stand on their own. While Bond Breakers is rather simple, its controls are good, it teaches a decent amount, is well structured, and some levels are even fun. Also, vocabulary is used in context, usually where there's only one possible thing the hints could be talking about, making it very effective in that regard. Once you've finished the core levels, it has the same appeal as Mario Maker in seeing what unreasonable obstacles you can overcome. The challenge levels range from interesting applications of the mechanics to sadistic ROM hacks with a lot of enjoyment progressing your way from one category to the other. And while the amount of information it teaches isn't great, it does present those lessons very well. Particulars is much better than all the educational videos I've watched on subatomic particles and far outclasses high school's coverage of the subject. The weak force is rather unintuitive, as it is in reality, but given the game's subject matter, the rest of the mechanics being intuitive is pretty amazing. The game's story is told through non-chronological between-level quotes from people in your character's life. It's an interesting way to tell a story, but it doesn't really go anywhere. The game's main strengths are making you think in terms of subatomic physics and the ability to build familiar particles, linking the information to what you already knew about the subatomic world. Moving your particle around screen controls well, it feels like attraction forces are not strong enough at times and too strong at others, depending on which you need to happen, so it's actually pretty well balanced. Some levels feel redundant, asking you to complete similar objectives but working with slightly different mechanics, but others get pretty interesting. Some even feel like a desperate struggle for survival, which is more than I can say about the other 200 educational games I've played. While the game has some design shortcomings, it's pretty much the best you can reasonably expect, while the educational game genre is mostly just garbage flash games. If you're interested in the game or just want to see how overly critical I'm being, Particulars is on Steam for $6. As a bit of incentive, I will add that Particulars didn't have a whole lot of sales, and this genre isn't going to get serious titles until someone proves it's economically viable. And uh, don't worry, I'm only going to recommend buying about 5 games in these videos, and you already own Kerbal Space Program. So in short, at a total of $6 and about 14 hours of gameplay, all these games are probably worth playing if you want to learn about their subject matter, and Photons is even if you don't, just like laser puzzles. Sadly, none of these games actually teach any of the math behind their mechanics, and they kind of can't, because without much of a plot or characters, the game would completely fall flat if it took a math break. Something like Zelda replacing a puzzle with a straight up math problem, assuming it was properly built into the world's mechanics, could actually pass unnoticed for what it was, but these simpler games don't have enough going on to camouflage their puzzles as anything but what they directly represent. I like these games for what they are, but textbooks don't shy away from the math, so eventually neither can educational games. In the end, these systems are just rules for building gauntlets. Challenges built off the idea that we learn when ignorance stands in the way of our goals. Whether that goal is to unlock the door, or to add relativity to Donkey Kong, and whether that learning curve is a staircase, or a brick wall. I have watched many videos about relativity over the years, but I only really learned the equations when I decided to make this. It took only one day of research and programming to build this game's physics. And that is the difference between a passing interest and needing knowledge to reach a goal. That is the difference between video and game.